Hello, everybody. My name is Craig Inetsky. I'm a PhD student at the University of Cologne. Uh, we are setting up the astronomy of PAP in, in Cologne. We want to set up astronomy on PAP. Um, <clears throat> so what we want to do is just try to engage the public and tell them a little bit about astronomy. Normally, we would have this event in a bar, but we can't do that at the moment. So uh, joining with me today is uh, the rest of the committee. Uh, maybe Alina, you could start. Hi, all. Uh, my name is Alina, and I'm a doctoral candidate at the University of Cologne. Brand? Uh, you are muted. Yep, there we go. I'm Brand Gages. I am a postdoc at the University of Cologne. Hi, uh, I'm Vina. I'm a Humboldt Fellow at uh, University of Cologne. So we are joined today by our very special uh, guest, um, Dr. Volker Ossenkraft Okada. He is a researcher at the University of Cologne and an expert in the observation and physics of the interstellar medium. Um, Volker, hello. Um, so, uh, you can start your presentation now if you want. Okay. Looking forward to it. Thank you. So then, welcome to some presentation about great astronomy in the air. And to start, I have to ask you to fasten your seatbelts and put your uh, seat back into upright position because now we are going to take off. We are taking off here in a very special lane. Actually, when you look into the plane, there are not that many seats inside, but you will find it's full of computers and operators, and all they are focused on the output of this instrument that you dare see the very back of the airplane. So this blue uh, part with the instrument sitting in front of it, and uh, they just watch what's going on, but to see what's going on, we have to think of what we want to know at the end. So what is it, what we are actually after, and uh, well, what is astronomy about? It's about the sky, basically. And if you look at the sky, you see in the evening sky in the winter here, the constellation of Orion, so a lot of stars. And at the end, it's standing there and you see nothing than just stars and nothing in particular. But 500 years ago, some guy had the idea to build some magnifying device, namely a telescope. And um, here is the telescope by Galileo Galilei shown. And if you take a telescope like this and look on the constellation of Orion, then things look different. So you can zoom in to some degree. And what you see there is that it's not just stars, but that you have, have some nebulous patches in there. So there is more than just stars. Uh, so all those nebula, so that makes just bigger telescopes. So that's the telescope that we have here in our house for student education. And if you have a telescope like this, uh, with the diameter of about 12 centimeters, then you can already 
look deeper into this nebula and further zoom in and it clearly becomes interesting because now the nebula itself becomes visible with some structure. So it's breaking up. It's not just a patch on the sky, but you see here some uh, shape in the nebula. So you have some flame-like shape. And of course that makes us even more curious. So the way is to be build even bigger telescopes. Uh, that's what is currently available. So here on the top, you see an eight meter mirror being built. Uh, this is then integrated into this big structure here on the bottom. And this is a telescope of the very large telescope VLT that is built uh, by ISO on Paranal in Chile. Actually, they built even four out of those. Uh, they are shown here. So this is the configuration on Paranal. And if you have really such a huge telescope of eight meters, then we zoom in from the VLT where we find more and more structure here when really going to an eight meters telescope. So that makes us of course way more curious what we see there. And one way is to ask for an always bigger telescope. And uh, one of the plans here is a 40 meter telescope. So five times bigger than the VLT that I just demonstrated that is planned by ESO in Chile. But at the end, what you get there is only sharper and sharper pictures that does not necessarily help you to learn what is really going on. And that's why we try to use an alternative solution. In principle, of course, we would also have a big telescope but we, what we are going to do is look at this jumbo jet here, which is up to scale here next to the ELT, uh, which of course can only house a small telescope, but which has a, a major advantage compared to uh, those huge telescopes. And the background of that advantage is physics that was actually discovered by William Herschel in the 18th century. So what he did is a relatively simple experiment that most of you have done to some degree at school. So just take a slit uh, and put some sunlight through it and then a nice prism behind that slit. And what you see is a rainbow behind it. So the nice splitting of colors. So you see the violet, green, yellow, red. And uh, so that experiment of splitting light into the different colors was known at the time. And what he did at some point is he just forgot the thermometer next to the screen on the desk. And what he noticed is that for some reason, the thermometer got hot. So it showed suddenly a higher temperature. And what he concluded is that there must be radiation that is not just the light that we see here in the colors in the rainbow, but there must be some radiation that represents heat. So this gives us a completely new view on the universe if we think of the possibility of heat radiation. And uh, to demonstrate this, I show you here my picture uh, in terms of heat radiation. So uh, you see me now talking and of course it's quite a different picture compared to the camera that I uh, showed you before. So um, you see um, the cold microphone you see, well, my nose is a bit colder. Oh, the fingers are very cold. Uh, and my head is, of course, 
warm so compared to the um, picture that you had before this is quite different can i switch on my camera as well mm. Uh, let me see how I can switch on the camera. Oh no, video should be on. Sorry, then that was an error from my side. Uh, so you see my picture and you see my infrared picture. And uh, that means you have now a completely different impression from me. So without this infrared picture, you basically don't know how I'm heated up. So this gives a lot of information, but uh, there is one problem with this. Uh, namely, I have here a small experiment. What I show you here is, uh, this is just a glass shield. So through the normal camera, you still can see me, but through the glass shield, you can't see me at all. So yeah, that means because of the water, we are actually in a glass house. So namely this, you all know from the discussion about earth warming or climate warming, uh, namely that we have the atmosphere which contains a lot of greenhouse gases and actually the main greenhouse gas is water in terms of the uh, co total contribution, CO2 is only the second. Um, and that means what you see here is the sun coming from, the, the light coming from the sun being partially reflected in clouds, but a lot of that arriving on the surface of the earth and then warming up the earth and the earth uh, radiating away heat radiation and because of the greenhouse gases in particular water and CO2 not all uh, infrared radiation can get out but most actually is not getting out which of course means if no infrared radiation gets out it mean there can also be no infrared radiation coming in so at the end we have no chance to make these infrared experiment that I did here uh, in terms of astronomy when looking through the whole Earth atmosphere, but uh, it means uh, we are to some degree blocked by this layer. And the only way there to get forward is to get above the layer. And that is now the reason that we go into the air. So, it, so what we have here is SOFIA, the Stratospheric Observatory for Far Infrared Astronomy or for Infrared Astronomy. And, and what you have here is a 2.7 meter telescope. So this is already quite <laughs> big. So of course we want to be as big as possible, um, but it's just the biggest telescope that we could put into an airplane and with that now being above most of the water, namely in about 14 kilometers altitude, we can observe infrared radiation from the sky and uh, get the information. Here we have a quick look into the plane. So what do we have here? So uh, what you have seen in the beginning was the camera being here, so next to all those control computers. And what we could see at the end of the airplane was there this blue shield and an instrument sitting here. And what we could not see inside the plane is namely what looks out of this window from the plane, which is this 2.7 meters telescope that is then hanging uh, or outside, so looking into the uh, atmosphere above the water. And well, you see there are of course more things uh, in here. 
So sometimes there is education personnel flying with them. What is not shown is here the crew that flies the airplane and so on. Uh, what do we actually see here? Oops, wait, this is too much. What do we see when we look in the infrared? And an experiment is nicely shown here. So uh, that is taken with the infrared camera and um, looking at that blob, you can guess what it is. So we observe gases. And obviously the gases in this case are not that smelly, um, but uh, that also contains some water vapor and other gases. So what we want to know, of course, is uh, more in detail, what are those gases that we can see in the infrared? And um, for this, we can uh, employ some spectroscopy, namely the knowledge that all the gases uh, radiate at specific frequencies. So they are special kinds of radios. This is shown here for an example, for a flame that if you look at this burning flame, uh, even in optical wavelengths, you see that there are individual lines in a spectrum. So they correspond to particular frequencies. So this is shown here for hydrogen and helium, but you can do this for all possible uh, materials that you have in the gas, of course, also for the water vapor or CO2 or whatever. So if you measure through all those frequencies, you get the composition of the gas. So that's the fully new dimension that you cannot just get from the normal telescope that we get this full composition of the gas. But of course, we have to measure all those frequencies. So what we need is a kind of radio receiver in the infrared. The antenna size must about match the wavelengths. And if we are in the infrared wavelengths, we talk about sizes of less than 100 micrometers. So you have to build such an antenna with less than 100 micrometers. That's far from trivial. Then we measure heat radiation. And of course, that means the uh, receiver should not radiate more than we measure. So the receiver must be very cold. And we count this in terms of Kelvin. So uh, well, uh, temperatures of minus 260 degree centigrade. So very low temperatures. And Furthermore, the frequencies that we receive cannot be directly amplified. So we are here in terahertz frequencies. What we can amplify directly are uh, some 100 megahertz or gigahertz. Uh, so we need some special technique. And the solution to this is great, which is this receiver, the German receiver for astronomy at terahertz frequency, that's what the abbreviation is for. And that is actually an instrument that we built here in Cologne together with colleagues from the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy 1. And the amazing thing is there, what you see at the bottom is the antenna. So there we have structures that are partially smaller than two micrometers but the whole instrument fills basically all the space of the bulkhead of the airplane. So a huge instrument there that should be moving. And what we then find if we really look at this instrument are a lot of quasi radio stations. So we see all those lines in the interstellar medium uh, that come from different kinds of gases. And you see some of those lines here have names on them. So they are identified water, carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, methanol, uh, acryl nitrile, and so on. So we have really a huge lot of different gases. 
that uh, they are all visible if we can make it to the airplane and use our great receiver. And for each of those gases, then we get a distribution on the sky. Uh, here is the example for our Orion Nebula uh, that uh, we have the picture that you saw before in the visible light. And on the right hand side, you see the same area uh, in the irradiation of ionized carbon. You see there are similarities. So you see this kind of flame structure there uh, that is visible in the optical and in this ionized medium. But you see, for instance, here in the upper part, uh, the structure looks completely different. So what is dark here is bright here. So we have completely different information. But there's even more than just getting all the different gases on the sky. Namely, what we have on top of that is uh, an effect that is based on something that you know from the Earth. This is the so-called Doppler effect. So if you have some moving sender, the frequency that you hear uh, differs from the original frequency. So if we have here the experiment of this car moving towards us, what you hear is something uh, like, uh, uh, no, well, maybe we can do it like this. So while the car is moving towards us, you hear it as a, at a much higher frequency than the original honking. And when it's moving away from us, it is at a lower frequency. Uh -huh. So what we can do in this way is look at exactly the frequency that we see from the different lines and compare them with the frequencies that we know from this material on Earth and then compute what is the velocity that uh, the material can actually have. So uh, that means we do not only get now the picture of the uh, sky in the different molecules, but we get really their motion. And this gives us, of course, now a new dimension. Uh, that is shown here on the right-hand side where we go through this ionized carbon and now look at different velocities. And you see at each velocity, you give a different shape of our Orion Nebula. So we go from a material that was moving towards us to material that is moving away from us. And on the left hand side, you see the same again in three colors. So blue is material that is moving towards us. Uh, green is material that is relatively at rest. And red is material that is moving away from us. So what we have from this is now not only a picture like you would get in the optical, but we really get also the dynamics. And what we want to know do with that at the end is really see from that dynamics how the gas is moving and how it's making new stars. So a process like the one shown here where this is a numerical simulation, how stars could form and this takes uh, millions of years. So of course we cannot wait for millions of years, but we can look at the velocity of the gas. Does it fit to such a model of the star formation? And can we really learn how stars form? 
and interact with their medium just from now having the full velocity of all the species of the gas, so having much more information than you could just have from the high resolution optical picture. And with this, I can try to bring you back to the Earth. And we are back on the ground. And now I'm open for your questions. <clears throat> Wonderful talk. Thank you so much for giving it. Uh, we have one question from YouTube. That was, um, <clears throat> how do you know which line corresponds to which chemical? Yeah, that's actually not so trivial to find out this assignment. And that's why we have here a large group in the lab of the First Physics Institute in Cologne that really tries to measure all those lines in the lab. So what they do is take those gases and put them into some long gas cell and try to get those spectra in the lab. Uh, of course, if one knows the structure of the molecule, one can also try to compute this, but this is very difficult to theoretically compute. So what is usually done is they try to measure something like 20 of the lines of one molecule in the lab and then make a model that may cover frequencies that have not been measured in the lab yet. So this is quite a difficult task to really get all those lines. And what we have some easy molecules here, carbon monoxide is an easy one there. We know the frequencies all very well, but we have, for instance, also detected complex molecules like alcohols or ethanol, where uh, we don't know all the frequencies well enough yet, but there are many transitions so that we have already enough that we are sure that it was alcohol, but uh, not for all of them, we fully understand the physics yet. So this is ongoing research. Okay. Uh, another question we have is how long does it take for the telescope to observe or how long can it observe without burning out from too much radiation? Uh, too much radiation is not a problem at all, unless we would look into the sun, then <laughs> we would immediately evaporate the instrument. That's definitely something we do not want to do, but the radiation that we get from the sky is weak, so we can observe as long as we want. However, we are limited by being on the sky, on the plane, and of course, we have to land at some point. And uh, usually we operate the airplane from Palmdale in California and uh, have to go back to this. So at the end, uh, you always look with the telescope from the left-hand side of the airplane. So you can uh, only go in one direction for say half the flight. And the typical flight time is maybe 10 hours. So uh, you can in pra practically not observe longer than five hours because then you have to go back to Palmdale for landing. So what we usually do is combine several sources that we have on the way, one source on the way back, another source, and maybe some other sources uh, interdispersed as well. So that gives some very complicated flight track at the end. Okay. <clears throat> Another question we have is, will heating up from the radiation affect your observations? Uh, does heating up the telescope from observing affect your observations? 
No, because we really uh, have relatively little radiation from the sky. So if you look at the uh, heat that we see in each of those lines, uh, this is typically say 100 times colder than what we would see from the moon. Uh, so, and the moon is obviously not very hot. So uh, to give you an idea, uh, the radiation that we see from the sky is not really heating up our telescope enough. And at the end, the photons that we get uh, are of course, at best not absorbed by the telescope, but reflected by the telescope into the instrument and the instrument is always actively cooled. So of course, that's the point that we have to have all the time some active cooling that the instrument as such doesn't warm up and stays at those temperatures of uh, so just a few kelvins or a few degrees above the absolute zero. Okay, uh, we have a question actually about the spectrum you're showing right now. Um, the, the comment was that the, the actual spectrum should have some noise. So what steps are taken to get rid of the noise? Um, it's correct that the spectrum has noise and uh, the noise in this example is actually so weak that you hardly see it by. So it's just the width of the line down here that is due to noise. So basically everything that you see here as a spike is a real detection. So this uh, example here was a really long-term integration so that uh, the noise was at the end very small. If you integrate only for a short time, then of course you have a more noise, but by having a long-term integration, you get uh, much less noise compared to the signal that you get from the sky. So that is our limitation in terms of the time. That's why we want to observe long because that's the way to beat down the noise. Okay, <clears throat> I think um, I don't see any more questions on YouTube. Um, does anybody in our committee have any questions to ask? Uh, yeah, I have one. Um, so what is, what's kind of the most uh, exciting or interesting observation that you are hoping to be able to do with GREAT? Um, actually, the observation that I showed here, or even this velocity resolved one that I showed before. So this type of observation to me is really the most exciting. So we have uh, here an observation of this region in Orion where we really now see the velocity structure and this gives us work for a few more years to fully understand it. What I want to have is the same kind of observation in regions where we know that stars are just forming. So the point here in Orion is there already a lot of new young stars have formed. So they have changed the structure of the region. So this is a very messy region, but I have regions uh, on the sky like Taurus that where I would like to have the same kind of observation and uh, to really compare the velocity structures in the different regions would make a lot of uh, new answers on how star formation can go on. Okay, great, thank you.
think that's all the questions that we have. Um, thank you for the presentation. It was very interesting. Okay. I, I enjoyed the infrared camera section. It was very nice. To yeah, see. thank you for listening in and sorry for the many interruptions. It happens. Hopefully, I will get a new notebook soon and some of it, then the problems yeah. wouldn't happen anymore. No worries. Um, a few people stuck around with us, so that's good. And I think they learned something. That's always nice. <clears throat> but yeah, uh, thank you so much for coming here and being in our first presentation. And yeah, that was a wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. And now I think we will move on to the discussion section of our event. Um, Falker, did you want to stick around for this or it's up to you? Or yeah, it, it doesn't hurt, so. Yeah, we would like your insight on this as well. Um, maybe some of Alina or somebody could not have their video turned off. Thank you. But yeah, so what we wanted to do was try to prepare some discussion on recent events in uh, astronomy. So we just picked up on YouTube. Sorry, what was that? I see the streaming live YouTube. Okay, I cannot it's breaking up too much. Sorry, say that one more time, please. Oh no, okay. Uh, Craig, we, I think Volker was saying that and I want also to um, emphasize that we cannot, at least I cannot hear you well. Ah, thank you. Uh, maybe I have to exit and come back in. And uh, no, maybe just a matter of maybe closing the microphone to your mouth or something like this. I... Uh, maybe I just need to speak louder. <laughs> uh, no, that's fine. Um, thank you. Uh, Volker was talking something about live on YouTube, but I, I couldn't find out what was it. No. Uh, yeah, maybe. Uh, maybe he'll come back. Yeah, I think so. But at least for now, uh, we can start to show you, or start to talk about uh, recent um, events in astronomy, recent discoveries. Oh, Falker's back. Hello, Falker. Uh, first event, well, we were just looking at some of the press releases, and the first one that we found was this wonderful image of Flocculum Galaxy. So um, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, the common perception of what a galaxy should look like. Even our own galaxy has these nice, well-defined spiral arms, and you can see this in many, many galaxies. Um, and this is thought to be <clears throat> uh, the standard form of how galaxies are formed, or standard structure of how a galaxy forms. But in a flocculent galaxy like this, you have a lot of dust, but no clearly defined spiral arm in the outer disk. Whereas in the inner disk, you have virtually no dust. And all of uh, these stars 
a dust free. <clears throat> it's just a very nice image and it's a, we just want to talk about what this means. So, so um, yeah, there, there's no spiral arms, but because there's so many young stars, massive young stars in the outer disk, then you have um, <clears throat> a lot of dust and a lot of um, stellar winds and things like that that uh, populate this, this outer disk with dust. And yeah, Alina, do you have anything to say on this one? Uh, uh, no, I don't. Okay, you can hear me though, right? Yes, yeah, I can. <laughs> Just to make sure. Yes, uh, but uh, still I want uh, to ask you a question. Yeah, sure. Like, uh, so why, why it looks uh, like the feathery? Is it because of the, uh, some uh, physical process there, like magnetic fields or some pressure difference? Do you have any idea? This is the, uh, just um, a high population of these massive stars and it's not mm -hmm. really confined to these spiral arms. Okay. In the galaxy, like around uh, Milky Way, mm -hmm. you would have these spiral arms that have these giant massive molecular clouds. Yes. And if you look at um, observations, um, usually radio wave observations mm -hmm. of other galaxies, and then you can see the uh, giant molecular clouds and radio waves, and you can see that this follows very nicely these spiral arm patterns. Mm -hmm. But I don't know how this looks in radio, but I don't think that you would be able to pick out a spiral arm. It would be very random at best. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the next one was uh, this is a very nice sort of paper. Um, so <clears throat> for a black hole, um, I'm sure that you've heard of Hawking radiation, um, which is a radiation that a black hole emits. Um, but for a splitting black hole, there is a, a theory by Zakov Zeldovich that uh, you can actually harvest some energy from the spinning black hole. If you were to drop something, if it was co-rotating or rotating at just the right rate and you were to drop something inside the black hole and then you could recover something at a higher energy, higher velocity, I guess in that case. But uh, so this was a theory for how you could amplify light pretty much when it accelerates past the black hole. And then you can kind of harvest energy from the black hole, harvest its Hawking radiation. Um, so that's a nice theory, but it's very hard to verify this. First, you'd need a black hole and you'd need to make something that would spin at just the right rate. And I think the numbers I heard that it would have to spin like a billion times per second. Um, and at that size, that's very, very large. Uh, so as kind of, <clears throat> there was a team in Glasgow and they wanted to kind of test this, but they, they wanted to use acoustic waves rather than light. And so they, they used acoustic waves and then the, the, uh, the suppressor, the sound suppressor that they used to kind of reflect the light. Um, had to, that didn't have to spin at quite a high rate. It still had to spin at a high rate, but not a billion times per second. And then they, they were able to verify that the reflected sound that they get from this device was higher than the, uh, the one that they sent in. <clears throat> so it was very nice paper and <laughs> some nice results. Uh, correct. Uh, we have a question and yeah. it asks uh, like about the previous result, like about the feather uh, galaxy. Yeah. And uh, the question was like, uh, why there is no stars near the, near the core? Yeah, um, um, near the core, that's all very, very old stars. Um, so 
they might have, well, they probably did have a lot of dust at that time, but then it just reprocessed, it reprocessed a lot faster than the rest of the disk. So the, whatever, di whatever dust they have expelled in stellar winds or anything like that, it already formed another star. Um, so then you don't get the, the dust in the center of mm. this type of galaxy. Yeah. I think there's a bit of a lag from YouTube, so yeah, maybe I go a bit too fast. That's okay, but uh, I'll answer any questions whenever you pose them. So thank you. Uh, if anybody have something to add with that. From the committee. Uh, I'll say no. I guess. Okay. Uh, that's fine. Um, but yeah, did you have any comments on this one? Oh, not yet. Not yet. No, I, I met you yourself. Oh, no, sorry, I don't. <laughs> no, that's fine. But uh, yeah, this is a very nice image. And yeah, so it's we, really we can, good. Yeah, it's a really this. nice result. I like this result. Um, you can find this article in Forbes. And they have a nice video that also explains how they set up the experiment. And uh, it's a bit technical on what is the difference with these reflected waves. Um, but if you can understand it, then props to you. I hope we will add all these uh, links in the description box so people can check. Yeah, that's yeah. a good idea. I will do that. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so uh, another result was that the, well, it's been known for 20 years or so that there's chlorine on the surface of Mars and chlorine in the dust of Mars or in the atmosphere. But uh, the, there's often these large dust storms. Um, so like, I think once every two years, there's a global dust storm. And then once every year, there, there's regional dust storms. And then every so often, there's a dust devil, small dust storm. Um, and because there's so much, the atmosphere is so active and there's so many storms, and this kind of mixes around chlorine. And uh, what this does is, uh, yeah, the, it kind of mixes up it can even bring up some chlorine that's kind of in the just below the surface of Mars. And then uh, this has some implications for uh, life on Mars. Because mm. This will, the chemical reactions that are associated with chlorine. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a nice result for the SETI people, the, the search for extraterrestrial life. I mean, we didn't find life on Mars, but it's a nice result for them. Yeah, so yeah, telling like uh, this can be a, um, like like you say, like water uh, or life. So chlorine uh, and on the atmosphere says that maybe there is some life out there was. Yeah, or at least okay. the, that would promote the development of life. Okay. Uh, I have a question. So this yeah. chlorine is produced uh, in the atmosphere itself, or is it in the surface or within the rocky part, and then it's transformed to the atmosphere? Um, I think it's a bit of everything. Um, there's definitely chlorine in the soil and in the atmosphere. I mean, that's how they would detect it initially. They haven't had a soil sample or anything, but um it's just that with these giant storms that are existing on mars it promotes some more chemical reactions and things like this <clears throat> thanks good yeah. yeah um yeah so that was a nice result and diamonds in the sky <clears throat> yeah so th this one is a bit different so if you think of Neptune or Uranus 
uh, these are planets very, very far from the sun and the surface temperatures are very, very cold. But um, because it's such a massive planet, um, it, it has a dense core. So near the core, it gets very hot and very dense. It's kind of counterintuitive. So the, not all of Neptune is super cold. At some point, there's the, the gas, yeah, the state of the gas because it gets so dense and then the temperature gets so hot. So the, what one of the thoughts were that in these hot, dense atmosphere, so that should be inner atmosphere, um, carbon just naturally goes into a diamond. Um, the, the chemical reaction happens very quickly, but it was hard to kind of verify this. It was yeah, kind of thought of, but uh, recently there was a way that they finally got uh, the test conditions made on Earth so that they could actually test whether or not this was possible. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, this article was in Science Alert. But yeah, that was very nice. Um, <clears throat> so possibly in Neptune and Uranus, I don't think they said anything about Jupiter. Mm -hmm. Jupiter is a bit different. Yeah. So maybe we have to plan next day next uh, mission to Neptune and yes. take some right. diamonds and come back. Right now, I think only Voyager 2 went past Neptune. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's very far away. The last planet in our solar system. Yeah. Because we kicked out Pluto. We did. <laughs> um, yes. Um, and for the, the next topic, solar magnetic fields, which is always fun. Um, so at least me as an astronomer, what I learned in school was more uh, how to treat the magnetic fields when you're kind of doing more space physics or physics at a, a planet um, and the interaction with the solar magnetic field and the magnetic field of the planet and so you just kind of consider that these magnetic fields just emanate from the sun. Uh, they emanate in spirals, but that's due to the rotation and that's not um, what I want to talk about. But um, the idea was that these have kind of open field lines, so to speak, uh, which is very counterintuitive for physicists because <clears throat> there are no magnetic monopoles. We haven't discovered any. So every magnetic field line has to kind of go in a loop. They can't really diverge. So like uh, in simple terms, you mean like every time you need a node and South Pole, right? You, you when you say like uh, open without, field lines, you mean like without, only North or South as yeah. visible? Yeah, mm -hmm. kind of, yes. Uh, so for a dipole, this would be more like the Earth's magnetic field where mm -hmm. it just kind of goes in a loop mm. the north and clearly defined north and south pole. But for the sun, that's a bit different. So what this study was working on was um, during a total solar eclipse, it would take a picture of the sun or what you could see of the sun with the moon in front of it. And you can see these well-defined magnetic field lines that are kind of emanating from the sun confirming that perspective, but this is not existence of a magnetic monopole. This is due to the stellar winds and how the plasma kind of emanates from the sun. Um, and if you can look very closely, uh, it might be a bit hard to see, but best way for me, at least, when I'm looking at it, if you look at 2008 and 2019, they look very, very similar. I mean, a few differences, but the basic structure is the same. Yeah. Um, and the reason for that is because that there's an 11 year cycle to the sun. So it's, uh, yeah, we call it solar activity. So the amount of sunspots, which is due to the surface magnetic field, uh, this kind of goes on an 11 year cycle. 
of when it would be active and when it would not be active. <clears throat> or sorry, 11 year cycle. So uh, yeah, 7.5 years. Sorry, no, five, 11. five years before mm. it becomes inactive. But anyways, so you have the same magnetic field structure here, 11 years apart. It's very nice to see. Yeah, um, and during this, like after this 11 years and uh, the poles of the sun will change Right, that's what happens usually. So the North Pole becomes south, and south becomes north, like like that. You mean? Yeah. Okay. Nice. And it is just very nice to actually see this from an observation. Uh, but they can only do this during a total solar eclipse, so this is rather difficult. You can yeah. take a lot in a row. Hmm. But it's nice to see this sort of evolution of the magnetic field of our sun. Hmm. But yeah, this is very useful for studies in magnetism in the stars. Although, uh, yeah. Um, but so the last one that we want to talk about was dimming of Betelgeuse, Betelgeuse. Um I've heard it pronounced many ways. So however you like to pronounce it, then. That's fine for me, um, but I don't know if you've been following space news last year, but everybody was, at least in um, the public data release, there was one that, because Beatles just started dimming, so then the public data release was that this might be indicative that it's about to go supernova. Um, but when an astronomer says it's about to go to supernova, I mean, that that can be like, thousands of years away. <laughs> mm. So that doesn't mean it's going to happen in like the next day or anything like that. Um, but the, the public got a hold of this and then everybody was worried that the Beetlejuice would be going supernova or something like that. Um, and then there was another study that came out and said, no, 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 there's actually dust. There's, there's uh, too much dust that's being expelled from Betelgeuse and that's what's dimming the light. So uh, you mean the dust is obscuring the uh, light coming from the Betelgeuse and which we cannot see. That's why yeah. we are like, so okay. It's kind of shrouded in dust. Mm -hmm. So somebody took a radio wave observation or mm -hmm. infrared observation mm -hmm. and like focus talk that you just listened to. Um, they noticed that this dimming was also seen in the submillimeter wavelengths. <clears throat> hmm. So now they're proposing that maybe no, no, it's not dust that's causing the obscurity. It's um, these large massive sunspots, uh, which is due to the magnetic field on Betelgeuse. But this was the theory that they came up with. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I think it reached its minimum brightness in, in February this year. Okay, like the sun no, have many back up. Okay, um, so sorry, like you mean like uh, uh, sun have minimum activity and like maximum, the same way even Betelgeuse have a minimum and maximum. It, it should, yes. I don't know if that's what they meant by it. Mm -hmm. um, Betelgeuse is a red supergiant. Um, and these okay. can be kind of volatile and they can be rather variable. Mm. Just an inherent property um, oh. due to uh, they're kind of always uh, increasing and shrinking in size. Mm. Um, <clears throat> so it, it, it's hard to make that claim right now. But yeah, I don't think what they observed was the magnetic or the uh, activity brightening and dimming, mm -hmm. but they claim that this was instead due to the solar spot. Okay. And for a very, very bright star to have such a large solar spot that it would decrease in uh, how much light it's producing. Mm -hmm. yeah. That has to be a very, very large solar spot. Do 
have anything to add? Oh, no, I don't have. I, if no. anyone else have something? Uh, no, I think you described it pretty well. Good, good. Oh, yeah. So mm -hmm. this is what we have for now. Yeah, there is a question from YouTube, and it asks like, how solar winds are related to magnetic fields. Right. So. So sometimes you can kind of get a solar flare or these smaller flares um, that are kind of emanating up like a, a, a rope kind of, of this plasma that's on the surface of the sun. And that rope is because there's kind of magnetic field loop. Um, it's, there's actually a very complex um, magnetic field on the surface of the sun. Um, so what I didn't show from this paper was that they had another image that was more zoomed in and then you could see a lot more of the structures right at the surface of the sun. But it's very complex, but so basically what happens is that there's this magnetic field loop that kind of starts to emanate from the surface of the sun and there's all this plasma from the surface of the sun that's confined to this loop. This is called the flux rope, if you are interested. Uh, and then eventually this loop kind of reattaches, but there's still a lot of plasma here. And then this plasma gets expelled and that is the solar wind. And that, that's the plasma from the sun that is kind of emanating away. And uh, in these images, this is kind of aligned with the North and South pole of the sun. So it, it's also rotating. And you can see a very strong magnetic field here in this plane of rotation. So um, as it rotates, and then you can assume that it's doing a lot of these solar flares and expelling a lot of solar wind. Um, <clears throat> so the theory for the magnetic field just coming straight from the sun or these open field lines, because it kind of you can kind of follow the magnetic field based on this, all of this solar wind and this so coronal mass ejection. That's what this plasma is called when it's expelled. Um, mm. So yeah, that's how you can kind of trace the magnetic field just by the plasma. And then eventually this plasma reaches earth, but thankfully we have a magnetic field on earth, which protects us. Um, so the plasma starts to interact with the magnetic field on Earth, and then it starts to follow the magnetic field to the North and South Pole on Earth. And then that gives us an aurora because it interacts with our atmosphere. So Northern Lights or the Southern Lights, that's what causes that. Oh. That's and then nice. there's, a, there's more to it. I mean, that some, mm -hmm of the plasma doesn't necessarily interact with Earth directly, but it has too much momentum and it follows to the tail of Earth. Um, and then this is called the magneto sheath, and then it kind of recombines and it's expelled further. But the basic point is that our magnetic field can protect us from that. Hmm. Yeah, to help. Uh... The person who asked the question got enough answers. <laughs> <laughs> and if anybody else have an questions to ask, I have can... one. Yeah. Uh, my question is that uh, my question is towards better Jews, and I want to know um, what exactly they mean with the uh, it. Beaming. I mean, is it uh, like uh, the average flux they get from this star during a period of time that uh, gives this conclusion that it's beaming or um, what is it? Because we know that the red giants are in the phase of um variability so they um 
luminosity is changing in the periods of from some days to like 100 days. Uh, so what do they exactly mean? Right. So uh, why it was so perplexing to us was just that uh, Beetlejuice for centuries or something like this was um, always the like around the tenth brightest star in the sky, mm -hmm. um, and then last year when it started to dim, it became not even in the top twenty brightest stars in the sky, and it was just a bit confusing why it all of a sudden started dimming, mm -hmm. which I think is still confusing that if you have this sunspot theory that that should happen at a regular occurrence as well. But anyways, this is the um, conclusion that they came up with. Yeah, but uh, this suddenly, it means like for a couple of days that the luminosity for, was so low or uh, even at the moment it's uh, it was, not glowing as before. It was uh, dimming, it was dimming, it started dimming last year. Uh, I forget like, uh, what time. Um, uh, uh, can I say like uh, it's Sorry, it's in ahead. October, yeah it's oh, in uh, okay. started like in October 2019 and it's like uh, till April 2020 kind of and it was like uh, 40 percentage of its normal value, the luminosity went like 40 percentage of its normal value and that's why it's like suddenly we could notice. And it was a surprise. Okay, but isn't it uh, the period of its variability? No, it's it's very no, longer it, than one hundred days. It's it's yeah, still but, in red giant size. Yeah. Yes. So previously it was it never showed this kind of variability, and mm -hmm. it suddenly showed mm -hmm. at this time. So everybody. Can I show the light curve? Oh yeah, sure. yeah, sure. Yeah, I'll stop sharing. Yeah, do you want to share? So that is actually some like some continuous measurement. So you see it is very low. Uh, oh, but uh, you see it is in the I'm very sorry, but it's choppy again. Okay. Just look. Yeah. That seems somewhat more regular now. That. Okay, perhaps it's more regular than I thought, but you could see at the end there was a very large dip. Yeah, it's kind of the uh, lower limit is also uh, decreasing. Yeah, so it's a bit strange that it starts to get so dim all of a sudden, but. <clears throat> yeah, that, that was a very useful information from Walker. Thanks, Walker. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, yeah. yeah, I didn't look for that graph. That's very useful. Um, let me just share this again. So that's sort of the dimming of speed edges. So that that uh, I think that was last week. It's based on concrete. I a press release on that. But that was sort of the end of the news, astro news. Uh, feel free to ask any other questions. We're happy to answer. And if not, mm, yeah, we have one request to uh, the mm, paper regarding the solar eclipse. Yes. Yeah. So the uh, someone is asking for the link. 
Oh, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so or, we will put if, all. all or of if them. you know ADS, then you could search on ADS way at all. That'd be mm -hmm. plenty. But we'll send the link or we'll put the link in the description of the video when we post it. Um, there are some things that I should probably cut out um, where I'm just kind of talking <laughs> during the technical difficulties. But other than that, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll put it in the description of the video. Um, and besides that, follow us on Facebook and Instagram for updates for games, uh, not really games, but places. You can try to test your knowledge of astronomy. Um, AOT Cone is our handle on Instagram or Facebook. Also on YouTube, you're here, so you know that. Um, so we don't know what our August presentation will be. I don't know what it will be on. It might be in German. I d I'm not sure. But uh, we'll let you know. Um, follow Facebook and Instagram to find out. But we do already have our September presenter finalized. And so we have Professor Michael Kramer, who will talk about pulsars for us. That should be very nice. And yeah, that's all we have. So thank you to everybody who attended, uh, who stuck through all the technical difficulty. Uh, we really appreciate it. Do you have anything to add? No, I don't have. Um, thanks to everyone. So we will see you on the next event. Yes, next event yeah. uh, in August. It should be the first week of August, I think. Yes. But you'll see us online, not in person. <laughs> um, okay. So, yeah, that's for uh, it now. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you next time. See you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>